Hello, and welcome to the RPG Talk Show. I'm your host, Hawk Robinson, with... John Wilker. And uh, this is our first 2019 broadcast. It is January 3rd, 2019. Woohoo! So this show discusses weekly news, information, commentary, discussion, and debate about the effects of all role-playing game formats and their potential uses for professional, educational, recreational, and therapeutic goals. The RPG Talk Show is not about just the latest modules and releases. There are plenty of sources for that information. We will mention such releases when related to the aforementioned topics, however. You can learn more about the RPG Talk Show, hosts, guests, and archives of previous episodes on our website at rpgtalkshow.com. You can follow us on Twitter at RPG Talk Show. You can catch our show live on twitch.tv forward slash RPG Research Thursdays, normally 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. We were running a little behind today, so we're 4.30 to 5.30. You'll still get your full hour and it's often a little bonus time. Uh, and then uh, chat with us during the live broadcast right now if you're not watching the recording. You're watching us live. We'll take your comments in the chat room on Twitch. Or Twitter. <clears throat> uh, right now I've only got Twitch pulled up, but I'll, I'll try to get Twitter pulled up while you're doing the news and such. Okay. Uh, the also RPG Research Patreon supporters can access the recorded episodes, so we record it locally, which is higher quality, which we upload, and the Patreon supporters get access to that a month or more before they are available to the general public as a thank you for your support. Role-playing game formats that we discuss include the original tabletop RPG, referred usually to as just RPG or TRPG, live-action roleplay, a.k.a. LARP, computer-based, or, or really we've been moving the terminology to electronic role-playing games, ERPG, and solo adventure books or modules, aka SABM. So when you use that, uh, those abbreviations a lot in the show, you know what we're talking about. If you want to know more about that, you can swing over by to RPG Research and uh, see all of those definitions there. This episode is sponsored by the wonderful Patreon supporters for the nonprofit 501c3 RPG Research, and also support from RPG Therapeutics LLC. You'll learn more about RPG Research, the nonprofit 501c3 Research Human and Services Organization, studying the effects of all RPG formats and their potential improved lives at RPGResearch.com, and about RPG Therapeutics LLC, the for profit professional services company at RPGTherapeutics.com. Our show varies each week, but a typical format includes the latest general RPG news related to our focus on role playing games and research, community response and discussion, RPG related theory and application discussions. Latest updates on RPG research, RPG bus, RPG tour, blah, 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 blah. put RPG in front of it, probably discuss it. <clears throat> RPG.education, RPG certification. Talk about the weapon, though. <laughs> uh, so, let's go ahead and start, uh, John, with this week in the RPG news, actually this past year in a, right. in a lot of ways. Some of these things are older, uh, so like December 14th, California election result with Dungeons and Dragons dice. Say what? Uh, in California. Now you check the source on this, right? This isn't this isn't like the Onion or something. This is Polygon. Huh. Okay. <laughs> now, California, two candidates for an irrigation district's board of commissioners ended up tied in November's election and had to make a saving throw last week. Uh, incumbent Larry Enos Jr.'s and challenger Milan P. Petrovich rolled a twenty-sided dice to determine the contest for seat on the Byron Bethany Irrigation District's board. Uh, and the dice was actually taken from a Dungeons and Dragons set. Wow. Um, now, according to the to California law, uh, ties are resolved by either drawing lots or any method. It could have been Rochambeau, could have been any cards. randomizing agent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. But they chose to roll a die twenty three times. I'm glad they didn't have to duel. Yes. <laughs> uh, but that's not so random. Right. <laughs> I yeah, that relies on skill. <laughs> Interesting. So Enos, who threw a nat 20 on his last roll in a Dysoft live stream on Facebook, huh. uh, sealed huh. his win 51 to 45 on aggregate. Uh, wow. So a natural 20 for the win. Wow, that strong roll there. Now, it wasn't his die, was it? Like a loaded one? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it came from a base set. Wow, cool. Very cool. That's that's a trip. Well, that's an interesting piece to start with. Thank you for yeah. that, John. <clears throat> uh, it's just showing how much this is it, getting it, into it, the in mainstream. In our culture, back, yeah, being accepted again. 
cool. What else you got there? Well, speaking of uh, being accepted, on uh, WNYC News, uh, WINC.org, is repeated that uh, Dungeons and Dragons are a critical event in classrooms. Uh, over the last few years, Dungeons and Dragons has been experiencing a cultural revival thanks to television shows like and podcasts like Stranger Things and The Adventure Zone. Uh, what was particularly a nerdy pastime has been embraced by teachers. Gamers can define fantastic monsters, dice rolling, and score telling people stories. And Sarah Roman, who can provide a chance to freshen up the lesson plans and get students out of their comfort zone. Uh, I re- listened to the two thing article. She's basically found that people were more engaged and were learning better when she made it a role playing game to learn things. Uh, Shocker. Beowulf and Canterbury Tales. She's mm-hmm. woven classroom assignments into an epic adventure Good. for students to play their way through. By the end of the semester, Roman said her students remembered more about the lessons and developed relationships with texts they wouldn't have gotten from a standard assignment. See, so this is wonderful news, but it's also really sad because we are now back to about 1982. Right. 1981, 82, when these articles were starting to come out and schools were incorporating role playing games into. The school curriculum, not just clubs after school and all that, to teach. Um, you know, 1984, 85, I was teaching role playing gaming five days right. a week in school for gifted and talented children back in Utah. Um, but the the bothered about Dungeons and Dragons, the satanic moral panic, crushed that. All the schools eventually not only pulled it out of their curriculum, they started banning the, the groups and ca- on campus and everything, both elementary, high school, and, and even colleges, libraries all over. They banned it. It basically set the clock back 30, 40 years, something like that, 30-something years. We're, we're starting over in a way, um, basically whole other generations having to age out that had all these right. ridiculous concepts. So this is not, there has been lots of research about role-playing games helping with education for a long time. That is not an area that there's been a shortage of info. It's been on the pure therapeutic side that there's been a shortage, and that's right. been growing recently. They do mention something about uh, kind of in, th- in the therapy realms. Right. Um, that's always mentioned. Yeah. Creating a character in habit can give teenagers already grappling with complicated questions about their lives ways to safely explore different aspects of themselves. Almost all teachers I talk to mention kids using role-playing games like this to explore identity issues, gender, and using it to wrap their heads around things that are going on in the news. Sure. Uh, Illustrator Phil McDaniel. Yeah. Um, although none of that stuff, is, they're doing any good research or measuring. No, they're just using The it. educational side, though, shows up in the grades uh, and test scores of the kids who are participating in this versus the kids who don't. That's data. That's re- actual usable research. Right. Um, all the other stuff is what, you know, when it's I was looking at this... Well, yeah, and the rest of it is what triggered me going into, well, we need to actually look at this. There seem to be indicators. Let's start doing more research all those years ago. It was because of what I was seeing on the educational side and then some of the stuff that was to, to shoot down the negatives. Then I went, well, there's something here. And then thus went this direction that, that we've gone. Um, <laughs> here's a perfect example. Rebecca over at the Role Play Workshop in Oakland, California. Right. She was a certified full-time teacher at a school. She was teaching. She started using role-playing gaming to help enhance the teaching. And then she noticed that basically using role-playing gaming was the best way to teach the subjects she was teaching compared to any other modality. To the point where she eventually, after experiments of doing after-school stuff and summer camp, after a few years, she quit her job as a teacher and went full-time as a paid professional dungeon master, game master teaching through role-playing gaming. She created her own system and her own setting called Abante and has been running. That was the late 80s that she did that. And she has been making a living doing that ever since. And then she's had game masters working for her, paid game masters as well, uh, on and off over the years as well. And she's the first person to admit she is not a savvy business person or marketing person. That's where she struggled. Right. But she's she's you know good DM, good teacher. It works. She sees, she's convinced about how much more of an advantage it gives in teaching. Um, that's a great example over decades. Uh, uh, the uh, Osterkov After School in Denmark, the, where they use two years of LARP to teach 
three languages, math, science, history, etc. And those kids on their exit scores do very well, comparable to or superior to their non-LARPing students. You know, generally much much better according to the and they school had more people. Fun. And they have a great time. Well, and that's engagement and yeah. everything else. Right? That's one of the, the arguments for gamification and such, um, and certainly for recreation uh, therapy and such. So it is wonderful that news people are starting to do this again. Right. It's also deja vu all over again. Um, but uh, I'm hoping this time it'll stick, that that the, the setback of 30 years will now finally get the momentum to really realize the potential of this incredible recreational activity. We'll see. Time will tell. What else you got there, John? Well, um, as, you, as you people who are watching this know, people play Dungeons & Dragons online where people can watch them play. We do our own show every Sunday. Unfortunately, I, got, I missed last Sunday, so hopefully not everybody died. Uh, did anybody die? What happened last Sunday? Um, actually, uh, what did happen? What did they get? Okay, they left the keep. They, um, nobody, um, no, but they had an encounter with some, um, long striders that the methods like to ride the fireball uh, shoots fireballs out of their eyes they look like plucked ostriches they normally <laughs> wade in, in magma and lava pools and stuff Scary. long story <laughs> um they're in the wild woods at the edge of the infernium okay so they're starting to have these very hairy encounters um and one of the uh, uh we had an audience member spend points to have them run into a wood elf Oh. Remember, wood elves are extremely xenophobic. So they had a little bit of an encounter with that with that wood elf as well. Who gave them... So they spent enough points that it was an encounter with somebody who gave them useful information. So one, they learned that the Mordredian silver threat... You know, they learned that there was something wrong with all the Mordredian equipment that was making oh, them be tracked. Thanks to the wood elf. <clears throat> they were clueless before that. Right. The other thing, as they interrogated before he left, uh, was about the situation up north that there's a war going on between the Northrons, the Centaurs, and the and the uh, Wood Elves over resources, um, and that that's what the group's heading into. So they got two tidbits of information uh, out of that NPC, thanks to an audience member spending hero points to uh, uh, intervene and help the the party out. Yay! Yeah. So so yeah, nobody nobody died, uh, but they've gotten rid of all their more dreading equipment uh, for the most part. Um, and they keep the magic arrows. It, that was all trackable. All Darn. trackable. That was the trade-off. <laughs> they were very powerful, yeah. and they were trackable. Yeah. Now they don't know the detail. It's not that easy to track them. It's not like a big beep beep, right? Everybody, every more dreaded in the world can find them. No, it takes a concerted effort from Morgana Le Fay or somebody else to know what to look for, uh, and go. Why are there soldiers that far north? We don't have any soldiers reporting that far north, right? It's that. Right. It's just a little. It's basically like if you had a satellite passing over picking up tidbits of radiation, and you go, there shouldn't be radiation in that location. We need to investigate. That's about the level of information. Right. Um, but they don't know that, unless they watch the show, which I don't think any of them do. So. And, yeah. <laughs> and if you're watching the show, you know, you're getting a pretty realistic uh, idea of how Dungeons & Dragons played, especially with first edition. Right. I'm going to pause right there. I want you to hold that thought. We are having trouble with our cameras here, so I'm going to stop and start it. Sorry about this. I'll be right back. 